Wow, this looks like a really great turnout. Um, how many people have been to an event before organized by the Populist Committee? Excellent. How many people are here for the first time? Whoa, that's awesome. So this is my second Populist Organized event, and it's also my second spring with Washington State Department of Ecology. And I have to say that it's really been a whirlwind. Um, I am really grateful to Heather Simmons for handing me so many great partnerships and so many great projects to, to work on. And I also want to thank Mid-Columbia Fisheries and the Populist Committee for organizing this symposium, especially Tori Wood, our coordinator. Let's give Tori a round of applause. <laughs> for, yeah. She's really done a lot of work here putting this together. So in my short time up here today, I want to convey three key messages to you. Okay, the first is that you are populist. You're this partnership. The symposium has always focused on improving outcomes for riparian planting practitioners. And I want to touch on how this all got started, the goals, and encourage you to lend your expertise. The second thing that I want to convey is that um, east side planning is hard, but we're seeing some success. We fail if we misread the landscape or if we ignore key limiting factors and or if we walk away too early. But when we have the right elements, we have seen that we can succeed. And I'd like to transport you to some sites that inspired me. And then finally, I want to drive home the message that restoring Eastern Washington riparian areas is worth the time, effort, and the money. Uh, this work has too often been under budgeted and treated as an afterthought in comparison to expensive in-stream projects. And I just think it's really great to see additional resources are coming online for this work. Okay. So why populace? The Columbia Basin Riparian Planting Partnership came about because ecology site visits were revealing riparian planting projects that were failing. We were seeing a lot of reed canary grass, a lot of dead trees. Uh, this was originally conceived as a one-off. Um, Heather thought of putting together an event to accelerate peer learning amongst grant recipients. And then um, she started talking to this guy named Alex Connolly at Yakima Basin Fish and Wildlife Recovery Board. And they figured with RCO that um, their grant recipients could also benefit from something like this. And in the first year, there were 120 people at the event. And here we are eight years later, our, our eighth annual populist event. So I've heard that what makes this special is the sharing and the learning. But there are really, there are numerous events like this. Um, that happen around the state. So what makes this one unique? That's what I want to talk about. Oh, look at that. The animation didn't work. That's all right. You can see all my points right now. <laughs> so this may change. Um, but at least up until now, Populous has been, first of all, east side focused. Um, we want to talk and discuss the challenges that are specific to the dry side of the state. Our climate, our hydrologic regimes, our weeds, our plants, our herbivory. Um, there may be some commonalities, but there are certainly differences with the east side. Second is that it's been vegetation focused. While we may discuss planning at various scales, the watershed, the reach, the site, and we seek to be informed by river and floodplain processes, our ultimate focus has been on the hands-on nitty gritty of planting and the determination to be successful in that effort. And then populace has not been salmon-centered. Populace stemmed, pun intended, from the Water Quality Grants Program at Ecology, where the focus is on non-point source pollution. So riparian buffer establishment is usually good for salmon, but it's also needed in places where we don't have salmon. So um, this symposium places the focus on the various functions that riparian buffers provide, both to salmon and to other values. And finally, it's been a safe place to discuss failures. Riparian planting on the dry side is hard. We have regulated flows. We have extreme temperatures, tenacious weeds, and determined herbivores of all kinds. Um, early presenters included topics like plants I killed. 
Uh, lessons learned has been one of the most popular kinds of sessions that we have, and we have some of that planned today. We have Kelly Evans with the Forest Service, Allie Ludson, Jeremiah Rath is associated with Chelan County, and Dan Ross with Spokane County Conservation District. So there's a lot of turnover in natural resources, and I want to encourage those of you that are new to learn from those that are seasoned. And I want to thank everybody that's volunteered to present here today, including the field tour yesterday. I hope that next year, if you have a story to tell or something that you've learned, that you'll consider sharing it with your peers. Over the past seven years, we've had over 50 different speakers share their experience at this event. Okay. So now I want to take you to a few places that inspired me and show you that we have some success. Last summer, Nuttow Salmon Recovery Foundation took me on a whirlwind tour of their watershed and show me past and proposed projects. And one of the places that really stood out to me was the left bank of Twist Ponds along the Twist River. Has anybody been out there? Yeah, a few people have been there. Great. So Metta Salmon Recovery Foundation has been partnering with Ecology since before 2011, and they really get PBR. And I'm not talking about beer. Um, their riparian planting plans are nestled in full floodplain process-based restoration strategies. They're often including side channel reactivation or in-stream work with large wood to increase shade and complexity to improve fish habitat and water quality. The left bank of Twist Ponds after 10 years of effort is a success. Tell me if this isn't a noticeable footprint. There. You can see it, right? So let's step back in time. Here are some of the practices that happened here. There was a constructed side channel meander, an 85-foot riparian buffer. They planted over 1,000 stems there. Um, they, you can see the, where they're planted in blocks. And we saw this yesterday down at Lower Sleepy Hollow. This kind of facilitates being able to fence and protect and manage these areas. So they put in a serious deer fence. Um, they had supplemental irrigation, uh, weed management, and then the big thing is this project took advantage of equipment on site for the side channel construction to also deep plant to ensure that the trees had their roots um, where they're getting their feet wet. So we're also going to hear today from several experts regarding planting in different difficult hydraulic conditions and also to address irrigation in those situations. Okay. So here's a kind of then and now, if you're standing on the ground looking at these sites. On the left, you can kind of see where they, they kind of put in this meander in this area here. And then on the right, if you're standing around the site, you can see 10 years later. So this site provides all kinds of benefits to all kinds of wildlife. What might that creature be? Oh, that's my boss. <laughs> um, these sites are meeting their objectives. They're strengthening the channel banks, shading the water. They're adding nutrients to the ecosystem. 10 years. We have to be patient and we have to be persistent. So let's keep going and let's not give up. This is the next project for Metal Salmon Recovery Foundation. Um, they're going to build on what they've done. Uh, here they've got five acres, 1,700 feet of the Metal River. They're going to put 4,000 plants in here. And this is in addition to 17 other acres where they're maintaining another 10,000 plants that they put into the past. So more work to come. Now let's talk about Mid-Columbia Fisheries Enhancement Group in the upper Yakima River. Um, here you can see the side channels on this river, river left side. Um, and over here you can kind of see the footprint of um, weed fabric along here, along this project. So, this is on I-90 west of Cleelum. The Kittitas Conservation Trust and Mid-Columbia Fisheries are the two key partners. The trust secured a conservation easement, and they restored that um, river channel on the left bank. And then Mid-Columbia has been working on the right bank here to increase near bank shade and then to keep, the, keep the stream cool. So I've heard that it's easier to keep a cold beer cold than it is to warm a cold beer. So in this part of the watershed, that's a good thing to do before we get all the way down to Yakima. Other goals here are to reduce erosion, increase surface flow sediment capture. This is a really big project. So
So on this site, they found an eroded cut bank and a disconnected floodplain, and they put in 4,800 trees here. And three years later, we're looking at 75 to 80% survival. There's Kat Strathman standing in one of the plantings. They have temporary drip irrigation, mulching, wildlife fencing. In the cut banks here, they use the hydraulic stinger to deep plant willows and cottonwoods to create near bank shade and help stabilize the cut. And here you can see what I'm talking about when I say wa uh, robust wildlife fencing. These guys are not messing around. <laughs> okay, so on another site, just down the river near Thorpe, they put in another uh, 1,250 plants. Here you can see me standing with the proud landowner. Um, she plans to protect this property into perpetuity and use it as a site to educate others. So I don't have time to take you to a bunch of other sites today, but I just wanted to show you some of the key elements of success that I'm seeing. The ability of us to have this phase funding and be able to follow up with maintenance, um, inform planting methods, really understanding those limiting factors and where your water table is, um, irrigation, essential, and um, serious fencing. I mean, if you're going to put it in there, don't let it get eaten. And then just being really persistent with the maintenance. So this last picture that I have here is from Chelan County. This is near the mouth of Icicle Creek. And they did this project here to stabilize the bank, bioengineering it. They have these um, fabric encapsulated soil lifts in this area here. And then they put in willow plugs inside of that. And then up here on the regular bank, they also have a 75-foot buffer where they've planted in their irrigating. And this looks like it's going to be a really nice site. Our recipients are innovating and they're learning. So my final point is that riparian restoration is worthy of our time, our effort, and our resources. This work has really often been under budgeted and treated as an afterthought in comparison to in-stream projects. And yes, it's all connected. I know that. And restored processes are critical. But on the east side, planting will still likely be part of the picture. And I would argue that if we're going to do it, let's not take it halfway. It's great to see the additional resources that are coming online for this work. And I'm, I'm excited to see what you all can do with those resources, which is why we're providing space today to learn more about the current and new funding opportunities that are available for riparian-focused work. So it's through the Soil Conservation Commission, the RCO, Ecology's Water Quality Combined Funding Program. I want to encourage you to connect with the representatives that are here today from those funding sources and ask your questions, including during our two funding sessions. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. And I hope that you get a lot out of today's symposium. And if you're in one of the central region seven counties, please reach out to me with your project ideas. Right. Thank you. on time. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, Tori. Thanks for um, inviting me to present today. And some of you may have seen my talk at the Upper Columbia Salmon Science Conference that happened upstairs a couple months ago. And I'm just here to build on some of those ideas. And this is really the forum that I, I hope takes these ideas and runs with them. And Julie talked a lot about what I'm going to talk about and gave some really specific examples, which I'm happy about because I don't have time to go through those. 
But I'm going to start by acknowledging my co-author, Colin Thorne. And Colin and I started these ideas you know, last year and thinking about the link between the channel evolution model framework that he was a lead author on and how that coincides, channel evolution coincides with riparian degradation. So I'm going to build on that and hopefully give you some ideas of how to think about this. So we all know what the problem is. Oops. Oops. We all know what the problem is, and it extends from the tributaries well above where salmon and steelhead uh, inhabit, where we have widespread degradation of our smaller streams, which, which coincides with loss of riparian habitat that goes all the way up into our headwaters. Due to past land use changes, timber harvest road, that has led to incision and loss of riparian and floodplain habitat, all the way down to development of our large river systems, and this just has created an inherent loss of riparian systems and function that we need to address. So my call to action to you all today is really to develop our toolbox and to build on what Julie said, really start to expand our process-based approaches for riparian restoration. I've seen a groundswell of um, innovation happening on the side of channel and stream floodplain work, and I think we could really start to think about ways that we address some of our riparian degradation through process-based approaches. Um, and you all have some great insight to, to add to what's going on with, with river restoration techniques. I also want to prior, uh, call you to prioritize intensive and extensive work that marries stream, floodplain, and riparian work. So this, uh, Eli Asher started this idea through results from our intensively monitored watersheds where they're finding that really we don't see fish and habitat benefits until we really have an intensive and extensive approach. And I agree with that as it relates to our riparian work. And then in terms of the way we talk about what we're doing and how we assess what we're doing and learn from that, exploring new ways to assess riparian function and ways to monitor these process-based outcomes that we know happen once we restore the riparian systems. So I'll start with just a really quick view since I'm a fish biologist and I work in the salmon recovery office. We all recognize this, but more and more I'm hearing about limiting factors related to food web and fry refugia and cover, and those all tie back to riparian function. It's, you know, filtering of 3PPDQ, we've got refuge, food, cover, flow, sediment, and that extends from the very edge of the water at low flows, which are about six months of the year, all the way up into the high flow areas and then the buffer areas, which provide shade and nutrients and different food resources. So all of these are important when we consider salmon recovery and the importance of riparian areas to salmon populations. And of course, planting in the riparian management zones is really important, but I think we've spent too much time focusing on those. And I'd like to encourage you to think all the way down to the, to the river's edge at low flow and consider what's available to fish within those areas as it relates to riparian. And why am I here today? Well, I work for the RCO, and as Julie mentioned, there's a lot of increased investments in riparian, and the stated objectives within the proviso that pertain to those are enhanced salmon recovery through the protection and restoration of fully functioning riparian ecosystems. And I take that to heart. I think that's incredibly important, and we should be true to that in the funding that we're getting for these projects. And also, it ties to environmental conditions necessary to sustain salmon throughout their life cycle. And that's what I just talked about is in terms of the importance of riparian systems. There's also an important DFW riparian assessment going on that I think relates to some of what we're talking about. And it looks at gaps in vegetated cover related to science-based standards of fully functional riparian ecosystems. So this is starting to tie through all of the funding and assessment work going on. And we need to start to think about what do we mean by fully functional riparian systems? And how does that relate to channel and channel evolution? So when I first envisioned this talk and started on it, I hoped to talk about our progress. And I went into our PRISM database where we document outcomes from our RCO, our surfboard funded projects. And it doesn't really tell the complete story. I mean, it says we're doing you know, 40 acres of planting per year. And we, you know, we are generally doing one to take 10 acre plots. I don't really feel like this represents our projects. I think we could do a better job of representing our progress in terms of riparian projects. It's not just about acres planted. I think it goes beyond that. And we're doing a lot of different projects that marry all three of the things I talked about. So river and floodplain and uh, riparian restoration. And we need a way to capture that. 
There's also been some project effectiveness monitoring that the state has funded and BPA has funded and others, and it looked at outcomes related to things like tree cover shade, woody plant abundance, and it's, you know, of course when we plant trees, we get increased abundance. So I don't think the way that we're, we're representing our effectiveness is also very efficient in telling our story of how we're, we're moving forward and, um, and changing the process in riparian ecosystems. And then in terms of our riparian toolbox, I think, as Julie said, we're becoming more innovative. We're thinking of new ways to, to uh, restore riparian ecosystems, but really I think we need to start thinking outside the box and developing new techniques and really address this need from ridge to river and from the edge of the channel up to the edge of our riparian management zones. So one way to start thinking about how we can innovate is to start with Colin Thorne's um, stream evolution model. And I encourage you to read this paper. The citations on the net is a little blacked out, but it's Colin and Thorne, or Clure and Thorne 2014. And I encourage you to pick up that paper. And there were several papers after it that describe this process. But it starts with the um, channel being here, the anastasizing channel up here, where we have really intact riparian function. And then as the channel degrades, we see a loss of our riparian systems and the function that's associated with it. And you really don't get it back until you come full circle to a stage eight, which is an inset floodplain where the riparian's allowed to grow back. So as we go into our riparian projects or sites, I encourage you to think about where is that channel in its evolution and what are the possibilities for the riparian restoration that we can do. And you know, think about the functions we can provide in each of these stages and what's possible. And within, um, within that paper, they actually have a table where you can look up the vegetation attributes. And I think we could continue to build this out. What are we seeing and what's possible in these different stream evolution model stages? What can we achieve with our riparian function using innovative techniques? So how do we affect change when we come in the, to these degraded systems that are generally incised and lacking riparian vegetation? I think we have to start with the process-based approaches that, that we've been thinking about on the stream and river restoration side. So how do we create condition, conditions that will capture and retain and support riparian function? So um, again, more, more information and more thought about how we can use these different functions to create riparian systems and in turn I think they will be they will also create functions that the river needs. The other thing to think about is design criteria. So these were developed for process-based restoration and I think we need to think about how these apply to a riparian restoration. So there's the process process-based process criterion. So looking at both how much space can we get for functional riparian systems but also longitudinal so how can we build on functional riparian systems and work downstream so that we have sources of seeds and propagules that will allow, and sediment that will allow for functional systems down where we're working. Um, materials, obviously you wanna use natural materials, but think beyond just plants. We have sediment and wood and different ways we can apply river restoration that support riparian systems. Obviously flow and disturbance are important, not only in creating habitat for riparian species, but also maintaining it. And then time, and we just talked about this, we need time to recover. And then it also takes a long time to um, not only recover them, but we need to think about where are we in the very long term? Do we have, uh, do we have new, new development of riparian systems? So obviously process space, so we're working hard across the Columbia River to restore floodplains, and this is gonna go hand in hand with restoration of riparian systems. But it may take more than just opening up the floodplain. You may have to do more active restoration within the riparian. Uh, materials, like I said, and these are pictures from the Metau because that's where I live, and I also feel like, uh, like Julie said, MSURF's doing a really good job of some of these approaches. So using different techniques to create channel roughness that then support the capture of sediment and then therefore the evolution and development of, of riparian systems. And then energy, again, how do we support the natural um, flow cycles and different ways that we can contribute sediment to these? And stage zero is taking advantage of that energy and trying to spread it out over the floodplain. And 
I also think that the way we think about energy in the sense that we may get a flood event that scours and, and we lose some of our riparian restoration work, but it'll just move downstream and may establish downstream. So we have to embrace energy as both contributing to our restoration work, but also can, it's something we have to expect and it's natural and it may be part of our process and learning. And then time, we've already talked about this, but I think you know, thinking about a lot of our riparian systems are aging. Do we have new recruitment and new development of younger plants and species that allow our, our uh, riparian systems to sustain and maintain over the long term? And so I really, I see this as a huge opportunity and that's why I'm giving this talk as many places as I can. I think restoration of, of floodplains, riparian systems from the very headwater streams where they're contributing organic matter and capturing and filtering water, I think that's incredibly important to maintaining habitat downstream. And I also feel like our main stem rivers are in dire need of restoration and that restoration needs to include riparian restoration as well as in stream. And I feel like we've kind of been siloed and stuck in adding large wood and maybe in some cases we may not be able to get full floodplain restoration but we may be able to get riparian restoration and some function back through riparian techniques. So I just, I see this as a huge opportunity and I'm really glad you're all working on it. So I'll just reiterate what I hope are my take homes and I would love to have more discussion with you today and I hope you all take these ideas and build on them because it's, this is the start of what I think could be a really important movement towards really effective riparian restoration. That's all I have. Are we moderating the question? I think they are. So I'm a ginger environment. I don't know. I probably haven't seen that. Yeah, the new water quality for uh, UT Ashland that's now open logging and for ecology. And as I've been driving around up here, one of the things I thought about is May stuff. And looking at the Okanagan, you know, there looks like there's places where why don't we just plot a big engineered wood structure and see what happens. And so that's something, has anybody done anything? Yes, but I often it, it sort of dies at the initial phases because you have recreation and you have flood hazards. So I, I tend to think maybe we pull back from the large engineered wood structures that are really difficult and expensive and maybe try some trench planning and channel roughness on those gravel bars and then, you know, work towards something like that. I do think there's a a place, places for large wood in the rivers, and if we marry that again with riparian restoration, restoration and, and channel roughness, we could probably have some good outcomes. But I think it needs to be viewed in, like I said, a holistic approach, and again, being intensive and extensive. So where can we achieve more than just a wood structure on the channel margin, which has limited value? Where can we go beyond that? And where do we have the process space to really have that that success. But I agree, I think there's tons of opportunity in the main stem. We've just been so focused on where can we put large engineered wood structures. I think we've missed some opportunities in some places when we have a channel, like a, a stage eight incised floodplain with some ability to work on the channel margins and gravel bars.
Well, there's a new Eastern Washington Shrub Step Restoration Initiative, and I would start there. And having worked on the riparian and wetland portion of it, there are sites identified as priorities in there. And I know Robes Parish with Fish and Wildlife, um, not Robes Parish, I'm sorry, BLM is working on some stage zero approaches in the Shrub Step. And I think, you know, it's, it's a great place to use some of those techniques because you see such large incision out in the Shrub Step that the, the only way to get an establishment of riparian is through building up, and again, this gets to Colin's papers, you've got to raise the, the water level so that it can actually water those plants or they're just gonna die. So there are folks working on it, and I can connect you, I'm just blanking on the name of the person at BLM, and I'm sure there's others in the room, so speak up if you're working on shrub step riparian. I just wanted to highlight an extension publication that came out of Oregon State University recently that kind of looks at those um, and how to assess those areas that are more rangeland or steppy. I don't know if any of you have seen that. Yeah, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I almost feel like we need our own version of channel evolution for riparian evolution and how that applies to different systems. I don't have an answer to that, Alex, but maybe someone in the room is, and I hope that's kind of the way you're all starting to think about this, is what are the different processes in place at a site and how does that either support or not support development of riparian systems? But speak up. I just wanted, oh, sorry, I just wanted to interject on that, on that point that also there are going to be some sites where we might not have that process space to work with, but we still have the opportunity to potentially reduce non-point source pollution, mm -hmm. and we should keep working in those areas and seeing what's going to help there. Yeah, really good point. Barry, I'm curious, uh, any of our headwater streams are going to have to do timber management, uh, private, uh, around the state I've seen. No, I agree, and I think harvest management and management of forests is definitely part of a process-based approach. We have to think about what processes are in place mm -hmm. in those headwaters and how do we support those processes and what buffer width would support those. I know there's active dialogue going on on the Forest Practices Board, and it's been going on for so long. I almost feel like it's, it, and I nothing to, against what you're saying is just like, I feel like it's almost focused us on buffer widths so much because we're having so much conflict on timber harvest and buffer widths. And it's taken away from our conversation around the actually active riparian system and ecosystem. And so I think both are important. And I, I know part of the DFW riparian assessment is do, it does run all the way to the headwaters from my understanding. And so I think part of that will help inform that conversation, but it, ultimately it's a political 
conversation that's been going on for so long. I don't know if you have anything to add about that one. I'm, I'm too new. I yeah. don't know if I, if I defer over here to our fund coordinator. Yeah. Or yeah. Anything to add on that debate? <laughs> I'm not a good one to answer since I'm just a scientist, but I don't know if other folks in the room, I think that's where we need to go with those conversations. Mm -hmm. And I focus a lot on the science that supports those decisions and developing the information about why buffer areas are important and why riparian areas are important and kind of like hope that that creates the policies that would protect those areas. But it feels like there's this great interface between stormwater mm -hmm. and our water quality programs yes. for buffer funding. Yeah. That this falls out of the realm and eligibility of our buffer program, but something needs to be happening there. So we need to figure that out. Yeah. Does anyone else have any example ordinances? I don't know. <laughs> good question. Yeah, good question. Microphone enough. Uh, <laughs> circling back to the shop step question, um, there is a kind of related group to this. Um, we've tackled some of those issues. Eric Lane's initiative, uh, we kind of meet about quarterly. So, this is where some of those conversations. Um, a colleague of mine, Mark Kesky, may just have emailed us. So, uh, if you know how to contact him, we're sitting in a break and I can get you on that. Uh, but those are really good conversations we're going to have with Eric. And it was Chris Sheridan at BLM that's, that contacted me about stage zero restoration. So I don't know if he's here, but you can track him down. They obviously are knowledgeable and they understand, but I think a lot of times I do, and I know um, other but it's trying to explain that level of science and also really So, um, 
I run into that a lot, so I don't Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm just, you mentioned that some of these like the stuttering of our like parents and our dyslexic occasionally lacks your vision or did you mention this in the So what I've been thinking a lot about is, I don't know how much people are familiar with like the Teradapt tool and other, the um, high resolution change detection. So some of the tools that are looking much, you can look much longer time periods, both forward and back. So Teradapt is being developed or was developed and is being used in the East Washington Shrub Shrub Initiative. And that's where I learned about it. And I think it's an incredible tool that uses Google Earth Engine and really tracks at a larger scale, and you can have models developed for just riparian, which is what they did. And so I really think those are the most cost-effective and useful ways to approach um, our monitoring. And that's just monitoring you know, vegetation cover. So you'd have to have it paired with some in-stream sort of reach assessment approach that you're looking at other reach characteristics that are tied to function. So I think between reach assessments that cover an entire reach and look at more variables than just stems and survivability with that paired with a remote sensing approach would probably get us a long way in understanding the relationships between vegetative cover and, and reach process um, and is very cost effective and meets a lot of needs. So more, less focused on a project and more focused on function across the landscape and tied to reach function would be my approach. And, and that's I, what we're looking to I would to just add if you were going to focus more on the site scale that um, our ecology riparian planting um, plan template uh, has just been updated. And there's a link there to some methods from Snohomish County, right, um, that um, has some recommendations for different techniques to do at the, the actual site. And we still are interested in knowing the fate of that planting so that we can learn and understand what works and what doesn't. So yeah. I think both. Yeah. Both, yeah. Implementation monitoring is mm -hmm. also incredibly important to understand yeah. what worked and didn't work. And that yeah. paired with a good effectiveness monitoring program could, could really help move us along.
Thanks, yep. everybody. Thank you.